the end of the world, the final apocalypse. It's been part of our imagination for thousands of years. In every age, there have been preachers and prophets who've cried that the end is nigh, people who predicted humanity's demise and claim to know exactly when it's going to happen. The world is coming to an end. There are always believers, those who rally behind the vision, who sacrifice everything, even their lives for it. And yet, through all those prophecies, we're still here. I'm on the Big Island in Hawaii to look into the eyes of one such self-proclaimed prophet and those who believe in him, to try to understand the anatomy of a doomsday cult. Reza Aslan is an author and scholar. Reza Aslan is a scholar of religions. Best-selling author Reza Aslan. As a scholar, as a Muslim, as an American, what is your reaction? I've been studying the world's religions for 20 years. And now, I'm gonna live them. I've been coming to Hawaii for years. There's no place on earth that I feel closer to creation. There's a sense of spirituality, of divine presence. You can feel it in the soil. The Big Island especially tends to foster new age spiritual gatherings and off the grid religious communes. One of these is called Cinderland, also known as Rainbow Village. It's run by a self-proclaimed prophet who calls himself Jesus. That's Jesus with a Z. And that's who I've come here to find. Okay. Aloha. I'll take an all beef. What do you think? Aloha. So I'm here like talking to people about spirituality and religions that come out of this island. Have you ever met this dude named Jesus with a Z? Oh, hey, hey dude. You guys know what I'm talking about? He's a guru in his own world. You know, well, he's got a lot of followers. Oh, my God, he was told to build an ark. I used to laugh at him, but, you know, I don't know. It's kind of foolish laughing anymore till you see what they really have. The guys at the hot dog stand filled me in on Jesus. About 15 years ago, Jesus with a Z bought a three-acre piece of property here in Pahoa on the Big Island. Since then, he's gathered disciples from all over the world, united by a doomsday prophecy, a vision that he has about the end of the world. Guys like him are pretty rare. Even more rare is finding one who's still alive, let alone willing to talk. About 20 years ago, a radio evangelist by the name of Harold Camping convinced his followers that Jesus Christ was about to return to Earth to rapture believers and destroy the world. The Bible says there will be signs in the heavens, uh, there will be great earthquakes, there will be islands will be removed from their place. The peoples of the Earth will be terribly frightened, they'll be calling for the rocks to crush them. Camping used the Bible to calculate the exact date that the world would come to an end. He was wrong. We're still here. It's funny, when I was a kid, I feel like you heard about cults all the time. There was all this anxiety and fear about your kids being swept away in some religious cult being brainwashed, taken away from you. Remember Jim Jones? He claimed to have visions that the world would end on July 15th, 1967. It didn't. Yet, far from abandoning him, his followers doubled down. They moved together to the jungles of Guyana and built a commune called Jonestown. A few years later, the end did come, though not through God's hands. Jones convinced this congregation to drink Kool-Aid laced with cyanide. Die with respect, die with a degree of dignity. Over 900 men, women, and children died in that jungle. And then there was David Koresh. I'm sorry some of you guys got shot. But, uh, hey, God will have to sort that out, won't he? 
His followers, called the Branch Davidians, gathered at a compound in Waco, Texas in 1982 to prepare for the imminent end of the world. It's true I do have a lot of children, and it's true I do have a lot of wives. Koresh believed that he himself was the second coming of the Messiah. The book of Revelation says that in the future, God will sit on a throne, and he'll have a book with seven seals in his right hand, and he gives that book to the Lamb. Your followers believe you are the Lamb, is that well, correct? There's a reason for that. When the government found out about the huge cache of weapons that Koresh had stockpiled at his compound, it didn't end well. Four years later, the world met Marshall Applewhite, known to his followers as Doe. We'll title this tape, Planet Earth About to be Recycled. Your only chance to survive or evacuate is to leave with us. Applewhite believed there was an alien spaceship following behind the Hellbop comet, just waiting to transport his followers on board. But first, they had to shed their bodies. 39 of them did just that in a mass suicide. I guess really in the end, when you think the word cult, you have this idea of some closed evil organization under some mastermind who's controlling the minds of all these people who've totally subsumed their identity into his for some kind of insidious design. It's not every day you get to interview a cult leader, let alone a doomsday prophet. This is an opportunity that I just can't pass up. I guess this is it. Good, man. You, man. Doing good. I'm doing good, man. Good welcome, you. welcome. All right, yeah, welcome nice. to the tribe. Uh, Aloha, Reza. Welcome home. How are you, man? Ooh, good, good to see you. see you. How are you? Wonderful. Thanks for having me here. Damn this paradise. is amazing. This is incredible. Welcome yeah. to our rainbow village. Thank you. It's beautiful, man. Follow me. Hi. I just drink it right out, huh? Great dog. Well, welcome to our tribe. We want people like you from all around the world. But how many people would you say are here? About 30, 40 right now. Do you feel like more and more people are starting to come? As... Yes. This year, we've had more people here than ever before come in. Why do you think that is? I think the time in the air right now is a sense of urgency in the air. The storm is coming. Aloha, mama. We got mama's kids, old people, young people. No one really leaves. No one really leaves, huh? <laughs> About how big is the compound? This is the three acres. Yeah. What did all this used to be? All this used to be is flat like this. And this nothing rock. but cinder. So this was just basically just all basic like rock, yeah. volcanic yeah. ash. Well, how did it become all this then? Jesus. Jesus built all this? Yes. You mean he planted all the trees? Planted all the trees. You're telling me everything that I see here yes. was, was, was put was like here this. by yeah. him? Yeah, yeah. The story, yeah, started like that. And with the help of the tribe, yeah, we've made uh, edible forest. That's incredible. Over how many years? Uh, f about 15. It's hard for me to imagine what this looked like 15 years ago because, I mean, this is a jungle. I'm not sure what I expected, but it wasn't this. What started out as three acres of ash and cinder is now a living, breathing forest with over 20 structures, dorms for men, women, and children. We've got fruit trees, coconut trees, jackfruit trees. This is one of our dorm spaces, just for women only. It's a goddess sanctuary, we call it. Nice. This is a five-bedroom dorm space, also. This is a bed over here, another bed nice. on the other side. This is a private camp. One mama and her son lives here. Oh, nice. And this is just them? This is just them. Right here, we're close to nature, close yeah. to spirit. This is our uh, solar tower power station. Oh, we catch nice. the sun, store it in the batteries, and we usually use them for just for lighting and stuff like that. That's great. And we have gardens back here. What are you guys growing? Oh, name it. <laughs> we got lettuce, tomatoes, beans, 
sprouts, kale. The slugs like to come in, try to run around and stuff, yeah. so we keep them raised. We have copper around the edges. They don't like the copper. Oh, that keeps them out? Keeps them out, yeah. This is our food safe right here. This is the fridge, right? This is yeah, the fridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the Hawaiian fridge. Fresh right fruit here. right yeah, up the yeah. vine. <laughs> it's amazing. Is Jesus here? Can I can I meet him? I mean, I'd love to meet him. I'm time. Gonna get in time. In time. All good things come for those who wait. I hear music down here. Welcome home, tribe members. Aloha. Many different kinds of people end up at Cinderland. For the most part, they are fairly young, progressive. There are more men than women. Ocean told me that normally there are a lot more people living on the compound. But right now, it's harvest season in California, and a lot of the Cinderlanders are on the mainland making money on marijuana farms, money that they'll bring back to the tribe for food and materials. Some folks here are just passing through, they have no interest in Jesus' prophecy. But others are hardcore believers. When did you get here? I got here 11 years ago. Where are you from? I'm from California originally. Oh, yeah? What were you doing? Like, what were you? What was I doing before? I was a technician, yeah. Oh, so automotive technician, worked at the top of my field. After a while, watching people live on TV and going nowhere fast, I was like, what am I living for? All this stuff? And I wanted to say the one thing. I wanted to say the word Jesus without people freaking out. Did he talk to you about, like, his belief and his prophecies? Oh, yeah. What did you think when he said that? I believe. You believed it? I believe in Jesus' prophecies. A storm is a coming. We must prepare. So would you call yourself like a follower of Jesus? Wherever that man goes, I'm going to go. I believe in Jesus. We have some jackfruit over here. It's amazing. So listen, seriously, like, what? I want to meet Jesus. Like, that's why I came here. There's a certain process that takes place and an initiation before we meet Jesus. Usually. Okay, all right. One of our ceremonies is you spend the night in a cave. The ancestors will greet you and guide you and tell you what you need to do. Koa will take you Koa. where you need to be. I'm going to take Koa. you. I've never spent the night in a cave before. I've been brought to a rocky coastline by Koa, a native Hawaiian and a devoted follower of Jesus with a Z. I actually like the fact that Jesus is making me do this. It shows me a couple of things. First, he's not gonna make it easy for me to meet him. That shows that he's not desperate for outside attention. He wants to see if I'm serious. Second, it's grounded in history. I mean, after all, caves play a huge role in religious mythology. But it's also theatrical and ballsy, the mark of every good doomsday cult leader. You be careful now when you walk, eh? Okay. Lead the way. Okay. There's spirits all over these lands. Very magical, very powerful, these places. Koa says these caves are haunted by the lost and restless ghosts of human souls. Sacred, very sacred. I'm not afraid of ghosts, but I am afraid of drowning. These caves are subterranean. Right now, I'm about 50 feet underground. Last night, there was a flash flood, and if it rains again, I'll be underwater. I guess this is my bed here, huh? Yep. All right. Aloha. Malama Pono. Might as well find a place to get comfortable. Sure you guys don't want to hang out with me? No, man. We gotta get in. Sure what? Throughout religious history, caves have been places of transformation. You go into them as one person, and you come out another. When Moses asked to see God's glory, God placed him in the hollow of a rock. Elijah the prophet retreated into a cave where God spoke to him in the darkness. And the prophet Muhammad's first revelation took place in a cave near Mecca called Hira, 
where the angel Gabriel revealed the first verses of the Quran. I actually don't know how long I've been in this cave, but it feels like a very long time. Just me and my blanket and my lantern and my coconut. And I am soaked to the bone. The rain is coming down hard. I want to complete this initiation, but there's no way I'm gonna risk drowning in this cave. I gotta get out of here. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. Made it through the night okay, huh? Well, hey, Jake. Uh, Thank you, Great Spirit, for blessing this town, bless this land, bless these I'll people. I'll take that. I'll take oh, that. Oh, Great Spirit. I got to tell you something. Yeah? I couldn't do it. Let's walk. So you're from Iran? Yeah. And you wrote a book about Jesus? I did write a book about Jesus, yeah. Do you believe in Jesus? I do, yeah. Jesus Christ? I do, yeah. Your heart is right. Today's the day you'll meet Jesus. All right. All right. We'll seek and we'll find. Aloha, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you so much for talking to me, finally. Been searching everywhere for you around here. This place is kind of amazing. This is my most sacred place at Cinderland. You told me that you built this basically from nothing. No, it's a lie. <laughs> uh, we built it from nothing. Yeah. Um, it was me and about a thousand other volunteers give or take, you know, a few. So tell me, where were you born? I was born in the Yucatan, in Merida, Yucatan, Mexico. Yeah? I was a good boy, I was an ashram boy, you know, I spent 10 years in Nanda Marga and all the ashrams in India and um, Central America, you know? Yeah. You know, that's what I did in my 20s, you know? How did you come here? <sighs> here? Yeah. That's a long story. Tell me. <laughs> See, that I'm responsible for everything that happens here, you know? It's a part of you. It is, and it's 15 years old, you know, and yeah. it's evolving, it's, it's growing, you know. It's teaching so much to so many people. It's a success story. Thank you. <laughs> you know, in, in a world of so much failure, this is one of the success stories. Yeah. yeah. I'm really interested in this message that um, you were... I have so much to share with you. <laughs> so much. I spoke with Jesus for over two hours, and he began normal enough, but then things took a turn. I'm not gonna preach right now to you. I'm gonna come from the eye place. I'm gonna own what I tell you, you know, take responsibility for it. I believe that my father is the sun, the heat, the fire, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I believe in the goddess, Pele. They call her Pele here in Hawaii, you know? But it all starts right there with her fire, her fire. This is where things got really weird. I am the Messiah. I am the king. Of the, the more he warriors. preached, the more manic and theatrical he became. He started working himself up into a fervor. And there was little for me to do but to just stand back and watch the show. I died for my sins. Not a biological death, obviously. And then, finally, we got to the prophecy. I'm a prophet. I believe in my prophecy. I had a vision, a dream of things to come. What did it look like? What did you see? I saw the destruction of the entire planet 
by an ecological apocalypse. <sighs> Millions died of fire. Millions more drowned. They choked, they got smashed by sea surges that wiped out the entire coastline and the whole planet. There's one hope. I'm building an ark to escape environmental apocalypse. This prophecy is a little bit hard to follow, so let me just summarize it for you. Sometime in the very near future, he hasn't set a date, California is gonna break off into the ocean. The tsunami that follows will flood the world, at which point 124 carefully chosen followers will board Jesus's ark and sail to Machu Picchu, which will have become a port city due to all the flooding. There, he will establish a home base from which to repopulate the planet with the offspring of his followers. There's an ark here on this, in this compound. Yes, we started building the ark. Can I see it? Can I see the ark? Of course. Jesus is a lot more unhinged than I expected. There is definitely something compelling about him, something that has attracted all of these followers. To be honest, he kind of reminds me of Charles Manson. That they look alike is undeniable, but his speech patterns and manic energy are eerily similar. Are you Jesus Christ? What's, what's Jesus? There's all kinds of Jesus. There's a black Jesus down in Florida. He's having a good time. There's a Mexican Jesus in Mexico. I mean, there's all kinds of Jesus. Jewish Jesus. I mean, Jesus, you know. There's all kinds of Jesus coming back everywhere. And nothing can stop it. It's a consciousness that lives in your mind. People forget that whatever else Manson was, he was also a doomsday prophet. He predicted that the end of the world would be triggered by a massive race war. He and his followers planned to wait out Armageddon in the desert and then repopulate the earth once everyone else was gone. This is the reason why we're gonna survive right here. This is what's gonna save us. Plastic, life expectancy, thousand years. So this will just be one piece, one piece of the larger structure. Yeah, yeah. of the superstructure. What I call the Armada, you know? How many more like this do you need? 20. So 20 more just like this. Exactly, 20 more. Jesus' arc is basically a series of plywood platforms lashed onto some recycled plastic barrels. The plan is to float the Armada out to sea, all in the midst of an apocalyptic tsunami. They've been working on this arc for many years. In fact, this is their third design. In the past, they've hauled prototypes out to a local bay for sea trials. Sailing now, babies. One thing to note is that Cinderland itself is the ark. When Jesus gives the final word that the end times are nigh, all the structures at Cinderland will be disassembled and the material used to make the final ark. This is all recycled material from the camps that we live in, you know? Why not use what you got? I gotta give Jesus credit. As far-fetched as this plan may be, he has these devoted followers who are willing to put their blood, sweat, and tears into realizing his vision. Are we gonna make it? Oh yeah, we're gonna make it, Jesus. Yeah? Of course we're gonna Do you believe in the prophecy? Of course I do. Do you believe in the Supreme Commander-in-Chief? I do. Commander of the SS Ark? You bet, man. Look, he's either getting messages from the gods or he's bat crazy, but there's no reason why you can't be both. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he's got people around him, obviously. They believe what he has to say. This arc, I mean, this arc. You all saw the arc, right? I really don't know what I've gotten myself into here. I really don't. Today is the uh, start of a religious retreat. I guess Jesus calls these every once in a while. They pick up camp and they come down here. Somebody told me the last one lasted 30 days. The truth is, is I don't really know what to think about Jesus right now. 
He obviously believes his vision. He obviously believes his prophecy. I guess other people do too. Not that crazy to think that we're destroying the environment. Jesus's prophecy stems from a fear of climate change, and that makes sense. End of the world prophets have often been inspired by current events, and climate change is as scary as it gets. As global warming gets worse, I wouldn't be surprised if we see more self-proclaimed saviors with prophecies like his. Pat this down just a little bit. Palm fronds are great for like thatching and basket weaving and yeah. making hats and stuff. Donald is the chief architect of the Armada. He's been with Jesus for more than five years. Maybe he can shed some light on what it is that makes Jesus worth following. So yeah, if you want, we can grab these, start taking them over toward the camp. So I finally got to talk to Jesus. Is he always like that? Uh, no, he's not always like that. Generally, Jesus, I mean, he's really grounded. He's a very intelligent person. He's really smart, but when he's really passionate about something, sometimes his emotions kind of get away from him. He, he acts out quite a bit. I've known Jesus for years, and even with me, sometimes if I don't do something exactly whatever's in his head, uh, he has a tendency to kind of, you know, kind of flip out just a little bit. Let me ask you a question. Okay. Do you believe the prophecy? As far as the, you know, the prophecy of the seas rising, I mean, I hope he's wrong, but you know, it's, it's pretty evident that this stuff is going on. And uh, you know, if Jesus wants me to build an ark, uh, 20 arcs, uh, I'm all about it. Jesus has really hooked me up. When I met him like five years ago, I was going through a divorce, I was isolated up in Maine in a little cabin in the middle of winter. I mean, I was pretty much on the verge of suicide, dude. I, I was having a miserable, miserable freaking life. So I was playing around online, saw a website for Rainbow Village. So I called up Jesus and we had like an hour and a half, two hour conversation. And uh, we hit it off immediately. And so he said, come on down. So essentially he basically just saved my life. And so, I mean, in, in that sense, I owe him quite a bit. When you hear something like that, my life was saved by Jesus with a Z, it becomes hard to just dismiss him as some kind of crackpot. I mean, clearly he has a magnetic personality, a charisma that has drawn people to him from all over the world, people who believe in him. This is Jake, he's one of them. What did you think of him when you first met him? Oh, I, I thought it was a bit eccentric, just like <laughs> anybody else. He can really get passionate, and his passion just runs a little bit hotter than other people's. He may start screaming at times, but that's just because he feels things are imminent. The clock's always ticking, and that's something that a lot of us really don't have. And he's, yeah. <laughs> he's really trying to get us to understand we don't have all day. When did you first hear the prophecy? Uh, uh, actually, I first heard the prophecy not too long after I started hanging out at Cinderland before I started living there. And uh, uh, for, for me, it wasn't like a shocking revelation. It was just something that I knew. Uh, what do you mean? I've, I've been pretty much brought up since day one to, uh, to know that the, the world's going to end in um, basically my lifetime. That's the message my mom drilled in, and I was so worried about the world ending. And you believed it? Yes, I, be I believed it um, entirely. I still do, and, um, but the thing is, uh, it might not be the interpretation that my mother had. You said that when you heard from your mom about the end times and the mm -hmm. apocalypse and all that stuff, that all it did was make you afraid. Why, don't, why doesn't, when Jesus talk about it, why doesn't that make you afraid? Because the ark is basically our vessel to survive the storm, and there's no guarantee that we will, but that's why we're all here. I think I need another shot at Jesus. I want to see what everybody else sees in him. Get him to calm down and talk to me like a person, not like a prophet. Maybe I'll wait until he puts on some pants. I don't know what to think, you know? Like, sometimes I get lost. I get lost in your words, you know? Sometimes you make perfect sense, and then 
I don't know, something happens and I'm, I just like lose you. What, what's going on? The effect I, have on, I had on you, you know, it's the same effect I have on everybody when they first meet me, you know. I've got this speech, I've got this sermon, you know. So when I first meet you, oh, f break it down, man. Let's see if you can even, you know, survive my narcissism, you know. And if that doesn't turn you off, you don't leave that day. Now you pass the test. So you feel like sometimes you have to put on a bit of a show? For it's a mask. I have two personalities. And I'm schizophrenic. I think that sometimes, you know, you're talking about this mask that you wear, and it makes you unreal fake. So then let's be real. Yeah. Do you doubt sometimes? Yeah. You know, I've been called Jesus, you know, since I get to the island. This is 15 years of Jesus and Jesus. And I didn't believe that Jesus Christ had even existed. And I'm like, well, hell, if he didn't even exist, you know? What the hell am I doing, you know? You started doubting yourself. Completely. Were you doubting the prophecies, too? I was doubting everything. And I went to go visit my family in LA. I was going to sell the property. You were ready to give all of this up. Forget it, man. My sister got a jacuzzi and a sauna and a guest house. But I realized I have the responsibility to provide for my followers because they're also coming here because they're searching in the same way that I was searching when I was their age. What you say is true. It's a lot of suffering about to happen. I mean, how do you think about that? How do you think about your sister, your mother? Don't you feel stressed about what they're facing? You know, you worry. You know, you feel sadness. But what can I do, you know? They don't believe in me. They all think I'm nuts, you know? Está loco! But listen, I mean, most prophets, their families don't accept them. So that's a pretty normal thing, I would say. I'd be blown away if everybody, like, instantly, like, oh, hell to the prophet, you know? But you don't think you're wrong. I don't think so. You ever thought about what would happen if something happened to you before the prophecy gets fulfilled? I mean, what happens to all of this? Who's gonna, who's gonna succeed you? I've been busy recruiting um, disciples, but most important for me, apostles. They go and preach and come back. Yeah, they always come back. Tell me about the stress that's involved in having to keep all this together, all these people who rely on you. What kind of responsibility do you feel about that? It's hard. It's really hard, you know. I have the responsibility to provide for them food, water, safety, shelter, but you also have to provide spiritually. I feel responsible for their soul. They're there because they believe in my vision. And there's fear that I'm going to let them down, you know? It's hard being a prophet. I get it. I see why people are drawn to him. He's clearly charismatic. And what he's built here is truly remarkable. A fully sustainable utopia. People come here because they're searching for answers. They're looking for hope. And Jesus offers it to them. No one here is brainwashed. They're free to come and go as they please. I'm certainly not worried that they're gonna all drink Kool-Aid and die. But I am curious to see what's gonna happen when the world doesn't end. Will this movement continue? Will Jesus' message change? Will it continue to spread? And who will do the spreading? After all, something similar happened with that other Jesus. You know, the one with the S. After his death, his followers sold all their possessions and lived together like hippies in a commune. They were waiting for the end to come, but the end didn't come. Far from throwing in the towel and calling it a day, they instead started a church and then a religion. I just need so what is this I hear about a spiritual retreat? What's up guys? <laughs> That's what it's all about. This is Shannon, Jesus' favorite apostle. Here I am. 
He's just returned to Hawaii after some months on the mainland earning money. My fourth apostle has arrived, the rabbit, the little rabbit. I like your little rabbit. I missed you, Jesus. One of the traditions at these retreats is a Hawaiian-style pig roast. Let's go get some pig. I'm a Muslim. I don't even buy Dude. pig, let alone kill pig. Shannon has volunteered to go to a local ranch to hunt for a pig. And I'm tagging along to try to get to know one of Jesus' most trusted apostles. Tell me about the first time you met him. How did you meet Jesus? How'd you end up there? I started hearing that the Big Island was a wonderful place to be. And so I go to Pahoa. And then I met Jesus. And that was instant connection. Instant, 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 instant connection. The moment I met that man, he was like the father figure that uh, I never really had, you know? Yeah. And I fell in love with the man, you know? Do you feel as though like you've got this burden to spread the, the, his message to other people? I would say that I have no burden at all. Mm. I feel I have a wonderful opportunity to share knowledge and inspiration with people. Did you talk to people about that when you were Absolutely. in the mainland? Mm -hmm. You told them all about what's happening oh, here? Many and... people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was mm -hmm. the, like, the general response? I don't get wrapped up in the doomsday because people aren't going to hear you. I have a way of kind of pulling myself back from maybe the whole, the, the, the part of it that makes you go, ooh, prophecies, ugh, you know, this is a religion. Right. You know what I mean? I, I, I tend to try to keep away from that because people just shut down. People just shut down. My goal is to get people to come to the Rainbow Village, come breathe fresh air and become connected and see what kind of information you start becoming available to. But you believe, you believe in Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. And you'd follow him. Oh, oh. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you'd have to you know, bop me on the head and drag <laughs> me away. <laughs> yeah. Well done. After hunting in the forest for hours, Shannon and I finally found the perfect pig. One that I ended up buying for them at a local butcher. It turns out pig hunting is a little bit harder than I thought. To follow Kapu and to be Pono from the Pohibi to the Vaivai. Yala e, yala e, aloha e, malama akua. Bless the food and the land. Bring us prosperity and health upon us with leadership with light. Aloha. Aloha. Okay? Gratefulness every day. Okay, everybody grab a f corner right now. No, grab a f corner. You grab a f corner over there. So I gotta do everything for you guys? I'm gonna direct this mother. Push! Push! Come on, guys. Regardless of how you feel about Jesus or his prophecy, it's hard not to be impressed by his ability to rally a group of people behind him. All right, guys, plumb, level, and square. That's not to say I'm ready to join his tribe. What are you, what are you doing? Man? Wait behind you, sir. Half hitch locks it. Boom, OK. Bring your offerings, please. Shannon, Donald, Jake, and so many of the people that I've spoken with here come from religious backgrounds. And that's a common thread. Believing in a prophecy, following a charismatic figure, these are things that are comfortable and familiar to them. They may seem like a bunch of lost souls, but they've created a community, a place where they belong. And that's a good reminder about what religion truly is. Because it's one thing to look for an authentic religious experience, something that's real or grounded or historically accurate. But I think that misses the point. Because in the end, 
religion is what people make of it. Circle! Please stand up and show your respect to Pele. We are facing an environmental apocalypse. For those of you who would like to join my tribe, if you are touched by the example of Jesus with a Z, I'm going to be performing a baptism at the mermaid ponds starting at sunrise. Religion isn't about scripture or temples or priests or rules or regulations. It's about the individual and the quest for meaning. The idea that there is something more to life than just what we see with our eyes, what we feel with our hands. That there's an answer somewhere out there. That there's hope, a point to our very existence. And if that's what Jesus is offering, well then what's the harm? I believe in Jesus with a Z bringing the people together. I believe that Jesus is the prophet. I definitely believe in Jesus. I'll follow that man to the horizon and beyond and beyond and beyond. I believe a storm is coming. We sailing now, babies? Prepare, prepare, prepare. I'm a prophet. I believe in my prophecy. I believe we are capable of great things. I believe we are the ones we have been waiting for. I believe in love. I believe in life. I believe in the power of the people. I believe in vibration. I believe we are the new advanced civilization. I believe in mystery and magic. I believe we can do this.